The time is now 5.01 p.m. We will now call this regular public meeting of the Board of Trustees of Humble Independent School District to order. A closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for this meeting. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed session, then a final action, final decision, or final vote will be made upon reconvening of this public meeting in open session. The time is now 5.01 p.m. The time is now 7.04 p.m. We will now reconvene into open session. Thank you for joining us tonight. Reminder that the meetings of the board are open to the public, but are not a meeting of the public. The Humble ISD Board of Trustees meet monthly in a regular meeting to receive reports from staff and take action from recommendations of the superintendent. The board receives the agenda and all supporting documentation several days in advance of the regular meetings, which allows us to ask and receive answers to many of our questions in advance of the regular meeting. Therefore, lengthy discussions are not always necessary on every agenda item. But as a board, we do have the appropriate knowledge and preparation for responses regarding the content of tonight's meeting. There are students and other guests present. To maintain decorum, respectful behavior is expected. Disruptful behavior and or comments will not be allowed. And with that, our first item. I would like everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and salute to the Texas flag. Please remain standing. We will now observe a moment of silence. You may be seated. Moving on to our next agenda item, commendations and recognitions. Dr. Brown, can you please introduce tonight's inspiring moments? Yes, Madam President, it would be a pleasure. So as you know, Hurricane Burrell threw a wrench into our schedules without a doubt, which meant we had to rethink our plans for convocation. Uh, we decided to postpone it for a few weeks and host sessions at each of our campuses. Uh, you know it, how it is when you're trying something new, you never quite are sure if that's gonna be the best thing or not, but it seemed to have turned out okay. And so uh, we are thrilled to say that Convocation 24 2024 was a great success, and so for this month's inspiring moment, let's take a look at Convocation on the Road.
to receive the Shine On Award is just really exciting and makes us feel proud and thankful. Um, our Spikes Game of Life event at Foster is something that our staff puts together for our school community, but it also was for the greater Umbel ISD community. From us here at Kingo HEV. Shine on on YSD. When they hear it, you feel the love. You see that it's a family here. What family do we have each other back? I got your back, you got my back. We're gonna make sure we have these kids back. Anytime you have cake and ice cream, that's a party. <laughs> they were having fun out there, and that's what we wanted. We wanted to kick off the year with a celebration, and I think they all did that, and appreciate all the hard work. I want to thank HEB Kingwood for helping sponsor the cakes that made convocation so sweet this year. also want to thank the principals uh, for making that happen and so much fun at each of their schools, and also want to thank Jamie and her team for really organizing the convocation celebrations at each of our schools. And so collaborative effort, and we appreciate everyone's help with that. All right, I shall continue. All right, I shall continue. <laughs> September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and ac across the nation in Humble ISD, we partner with three local nonprofit charities, Addie's Faith Foundation, the L3 Foundation, and Mothers Against Cancer uh, to raise awareness. And as you can see tonight, many are wearing the newest Gold Fight Win t-shirts, which all of us, I think we have a lot of us have, oh, that's okay. It's all right. It's all right. She had it on. She had it on, which was de designed by an humble ISD student. And so we're going to watch a short video uh, about what inspired this design and how you can get your very own Gold Fight Win t-shirt. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and here in Umbel ISD, we go gold. Each year, Umbel ISD partners with three local nonprofits, Addie Faith Foundation, the L3 Foundation, and Mothers Against Cancer to promote Gold Fight Win. As a part of Gold Fight Win, a t-shirt is designed through a district-wide student contest each year. Hi, my name is Meredith Reynolds, and I'm a sophomore at Kingwood High School and a proud member of the Kingwood Phillies dance team. I'm also the designer of this year's Go Fight Win t-shirt. When designing the Go Fight Win t-shirt, I wanted to have pediatric cancer awareness prominently placed inside the ribbon. I'm honored to have my design on this year's t-shirt for such a great cause that impacts so many people in my community. Go Fight Win is important to me because I'm connected to Landon, who the L3 Foundation was started for. My sister Allison attended Foster with him. You can show your support for Gold Fight Win by purchasing the t-shirt for $15 at Ace Hardware stores located in Kingwood and Tascacita while supplies last. All proceeds from the t-shirt sales go back to the three nonprofit organizations. Friday, September 13th is Gold Fight Win Day across Umbel ISD. Be sure to wear your t-shirt as we continue to raise awareness for childhood cancer. Let's Gold Fight Win! 
All right, I want to recognize Kingwood High School sophomore Meredith Reynolds. Where is Meredith? Stand up, take a wave. Yeah. Great design. Congratulations. And as Meredith mentioned, uh, Friday, September 13th is Gold Fight Win Day across Humble ISD, and we look forward to seeing everyone in their gold. So that's this Friday. All right, moving on. The Humble ISD Police Department is celebrating its 30th anniversary this school year. Humble ID, ISD Police provide leadership and service statewide, and here to tell us more is our state representative, the Honorable Charles Cunningham. Thank you, Dr. Brown, uh, Madam President, board members, Andy, made sure it wasn't my phone, <laughs> uh, and the unbiased community family here. I want to say good evening to everyone. Uh, you know what, and I'll, I'll go back and get it here. But if I could just briefly, I just want to kind of talk about a uh, bill, a particular bill, and it was a Senate Bill 1445. And Senate Bill 1445 was the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. It was passed by the 88 legislature. I was able to pass that. Uh, requires the establishment of an advisory committee to work with the commission to address several issues related to law enforcement, the law enforcement profession. Some of those issues are minimum standards for law enforcement agencies, examination of licensees, and misconduct investigation and hiring procedures. On September 13th of last year, uh, Chief Solomon Cook was selected to serve on the Texas Commission of Law Enforcement Advisory Committee to address minimum standards for law enforcement agencies. Chief Cook was one of two ISD chiefs who was selected from the vast number of chiefs statewide uh, who, were screened, uh, who were screened to serve on the minimum standards of law enforcement agencies advisory committee. The committee was tasked to complete uh, this project by March 1st of 2024 and they were successfully uh, completed their project before the deadline. Uh, for this contribution and diligent work, he has been presented with a proclamation from our governor, Governor Greg Abbott. I have it, I'm gonna show it in just a minute. But I just wanted to say this, out of the 20 plus years that I've been knowing the chief, uh, he has always had a high, high standard of ethics and professionalism. And so, Chief, for that, I want to personally say thank you. And so, uh, and I think the Umbai SD family should say thank you. Now, hold on, let me get your pack. You want us to take a, the full yes. board, take a picture, everyone? In, in just a minute, in just a minute. You know, you know how I'm doing this thing here, <laughs> Chief. I'm, go, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to look at this right here because, I mean, and look, y'all should just see this. This thing looks beautiful. But I'll tell you, it says, the state of Texas governor, to all who may be present shall come, greetings. Know ye that this is the official recognition presented to Chief Solomon Cook in, rec in recognition of it and of appreciation for his meritorious service to the state of Texas as a member of the Commission on Law Enforcement, Law Enforcement Agency Standards Advisory Committee, signed by Governor Greg Abbott. Chief, once again, thank you. Okay, now we're going to go down and take a picture.
no one move. Uh, staff, please come forward. These are the people that have my back every day. And I have to have them in this picture also. Everybody. Well, we certainly appreciate Chief and the entire police department and also Representative Cunningham. Thank you so much for coming out. I don't know, many of you may know this, but Mr. Cunningham's a longtime public servant, served on this board for many, many years. And so now he's, he serves us in Austin, Texas, and we appreciate that so much. All right, tonight is, we, is a special as we celebrate our secondary teachers of the year. And so Mr. Donnie Bodron, Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, and Mr. Todd Hicks, Assistant Superintendent of High Schools, will now come to the podium and introduce our secondary Teachers of the Year. Excited about this. Yes, thank you, Dr. Brown, uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, tonight I've got the privilege of recognizing our middle school teachers of the year, um, and we will remember these teachers certainly for a lifetime. So tonight from our middle school schools, I proudly recognize from Atascacita Middle School, Miss Brittany Inglis, Woo! Campus Teacher of the Year. You're going right up here. From Autumn Ridge Middle School, Kiara Mims, Campus Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. From Creekwood Middle School, Julianne Wilrot. Ms. Wilrot is also being honored as a district finalist. Unfortunately, she could not be with us tonight, um, so we will get her her award. From Humble Middle School, Desdemona Lamar, Campus Teacher of the Year. From Kingwood Middle School, Megan Prue, Campus Teacher of the Year, and also being recognized as a district finalist. From Riverwood Middle School, Libby DeFries, Campus Teacher of the Year. From Ross Sterling Middle School, Daniel Rivas, Campus Teacher of the Year. Timberwood Middle School's Timothy Harris was the Campus Teacher of the Year, and unfortunately he's not with us here tonight, so we will get him his award. From Westlake Middle School, Joni Searles, Campus Teacher of the Year. And from Wood Creek Middle School, Crystal Wright, Campus Teacher of the Year. He said one big picture. Okay, and from our high schools, I am proud to recognize, starting with Atascacita High School, Charles Godfrey, Campus Teacher of the Year. And from Humble High School, Laura Stokes, Campus, Campus Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. 
And from Kingwood High School, Tyler Morrison, Campus Teacher of the Year, and Mr. Morrison is also being honored as a district finalist. From Kingwood Park High School, Dr. Kevin Kaisley, Campus Teacher of the Year, and Dr. Kaisley is also being honored as a district finalist. <laughs> From Guy M. Sconzo Early College High School, Adrian Gibson, Campus Teacher of the Year. From Summer Creek High School, Cameron Bradford, Campus Teacher of the Year, and Mr. Bradford is also being honored as a district finalist and secondary teacher of the year. And from the Community Learning Center, Emily Gibson, Campus Teacher of the Year. And I think we're going to take a group photo at this point. All right. Congratulations to all of our secondary teachers of the year. At this time, many of our teachers will need to leave so that they can be prepared for the school day tomorrow. And Humble ISD looks forward to recognizing our elementary teachers of the year next month at the October board meeting. Again, congratulations to all our teachers of the year. Uh, quite an honor to be in here with you. And so uh, thank you so much for everything that you do. And Madam President, this concludes tonight's recognitions. The next item is public comment. The board encourages comments from citizens of the district or from district employees. Anyone wishing to speak either as an individual or as a representative of, of a group may do so following the procedure outlined on the agenda. The board asks that comments pertain to public education issues and be no longer than two minutes. Remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda for today's meeting. If an issue mentioned is 
listed on tonight's agenda, the board will defer discussion until the appropriate time during the meeting. In addition, the board has adopted complaint procedures that are designed to secure at the lowest level uh, administrative a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. Complaints brought by students or their parents, by employees, and by citizens may be heard in accordance with the board policies. Each of these processes provides that if a resolution cannot be achieved administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of our district policy on public participation in meetings and filing complaints are available on the Umbel ISD website. The first person signed up for public comment is Isabel Flenner. But if I could get um, Mr. Alfred Sutherland, Ms. Deanie Allen, and Ms. Gail Sampley to come to this front row and, and be seated. Thank you. Ms. Flinner, are you ready? Yes. I am astonished, amazed, flabbergasted, bewildered that you are more worried about the dress code for students and teachers instead of the assistant's athletic director allegedly stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from the district. I have the audit that you have been hiding. So you mean to tell me that the assistant athletic director allegedly embezzled money that filed then filed a Title IX report against her boss and you guys failed to tell us that important information. According to these emails, it looks like some board members even tried to cover it up. Our students are getting hit by cars on the way to school because we can't afford buses anymore since you all spent all this money on attorneys and covering up a crime. All to what, fire Dr. Fagan? Is that why you fired Do Mr. Thomas Newman? Because he got in the way of your plan of firing Dr. Fagan? Shouldn't your first priority be keeping us safe, keeping us alive? Clearly, you have your priorities all wrong. You are worried about how we dress and if someone has a facial piercing over missing money and a plot because you don't like the person in charge of the district. Your actions are disgusting because clearly our safety isn't a priority to you. Thank you, Mrs. Flinner. Good evening. Mr. Sutherland, sorry. I'd like to also comment about what she just said. But first, I'm going to start with why I was here. As a, as a school district, the district is a recipient of federal funds. And as a recipient of federal funds, they are subject to Title 34 CFR 106.71. That's a federal regulation which provides no recipient or other person may intimidate threaten, coerce, or discriminate against any individual for the purpose of interfering with any right or privilege secured by Title IX or this part, or because the individual has made any report, a report or complaint, testified, assisted, or participated, or refused to participate in any manner in an investigation, proceeding, or hearing under this part. It also says the recipient must keep confidential the identity of any individual who's made a report or complaint of sex discrimination, including any individual who's made a report or filed a formal complaint of sexual harassment, any complainant, any individuals reported to be the perpetrator of sex discrimination, any respondent, and any witness. In other words, that information has to be kept quiet and kept confidential under the law. With respect to allegations that individuals who filed Title IX complaints have been involved in theft, I will tell you that is false. To the extent that that has been said, they may, you who say that may be looking forward to information and invitation to report your findings in a court of law. Truth is a defense. If you think you've got the truth, bring it forward. If you don't, be prepared to retract those statements or face litigation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Allen. I don't know. How can I follow that? <laughs> Ms. 
Ms. Allen? Yes, I am Deanie Allen, retired Humble ISD reading specialist and dyslexia specialist. I am 76 years old, perhaps the oldest person in this room. I grew up in the Deep South, the segregated Deep South. I heard the N word a lot. African Americans were discriminated against and people used the Bible to justify it. Did you know that until 1965, Humble ISD bussed all African American students to another district? Thank goodness times have changed. That's why I was so sad to hear Tracy Shannon speak at the last meeting. She has targeted a new group to discriminate against. She wants to ban books about our rainbow kids, gay, trans, and folks whose outsides don't match their insides. Yep, it's a medical fact. As an humble teacher, I was told to welcome every student that walked in my door. I was told to help every student thrive and succeed. These rainbow students, they're our students. Their scores are our scores. Rainbow students deserve their same respect as other students. They deserve to read books that reflect themselves. It is the fact that every humble parent already has the power to control the books their student reads. But now, a small handful of folks want to control what every child reads. I say, give every student the freedom to read. Thank you, Mrs. Allen. Mrs. Sampley? My name is Gail Sampley, and I am speaking on behalf of myself. For 24 years, I was the district's only elementary discipline program teacher. Each of those years, a contract was executed with my signature and that of the school board president. I am here tonight to talk about contracts. I am so sad that the governing body elected by this community to oversee the education of almost 50,000 school children in Humble ISD has become a master class of dysfunction, irresponsibility, and broken promises. As a behavior teacher, my students and I signed contracts. I told each child what was expected of his or her behavior, and in turn, what they could expect from me. Each of us signed our name on that contract. I stood by my word. They trusted that I would follow that contract explicitly. I made a promise and I kept it. Terminating the superintendent without regard to the requirements inside her contract is a broken promise. Your actions do matter. Contracts for all teachers to include the superintendent should be followed with fidelity. Your termination of the superintendent without compliance to the safeguards the contract provides is fundamentally wrong. Your handling of the termination of the superintendent has many teachers asking themselves, if they can do this to her, what will stop them from doing that to me? Additionally, your actions affect the reputation of this district in the education community beyond Humble ISD. The knowledge that you do not honor legal agreements and are willing to violate your contractual obligations will impact our ability to attract talent in the classroom and leadership into Humble ISD moving forward. Fix this. Thank you, Mrs. Sampley. Um, Larkin Luna, and can I please get Shirley Fuller, Eric Willing, and Scott Ford to come to the front row? Ms. Luna. Good evening. My name is Larkin Luna, and I'm a current junior at Atascocita High School. Last Tuesday, I created a petition and made efforts to gather signatures regarding the review of the current Umbel ISD dress code. 
As of now, my petition has 1,593 signatures from supporters across the district. It has been undeniably unanimous among students that the current dress code is unfair and unnecessary. How does the way we dress or the piercings we have affect our learning? Why should these rules be so strict for female students but less for males? What exactly keeps those rules in place aside from someone's morals some 20 years ago? People argue that the dress code has been this way for years, but certain parts of it have been reviewed before, so why not now? Times are changing and we live in a more open-minded, more progressive world. It's time to let go of these old rules and start creating new ones for the new generations that your schools hold. Otherwise, how should we express ourselves in ways that truly matter? Not only do these outdated rules restrict students, but they reinforce old misogynistic ideals that go as far as to dictate the expression of even our teachers. Perhaps it's time to start looking for ways to accommodate for new social standards. How many piercings are okay? What kind of clothing can we start allowing? Even small steps forward are significant enough to make a difference in the lives of students, teachers, and many others alike, not only for our comfort, but for our expression as we come into this new age of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fuller. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am Shirley Fuller, a proud Wildcat teacher from Humble Middle School. I believe our district's dress code is outdated and our outdated and no longer reflects the diversity of our staff and students. In 2021, in this very room, I was hired as a long-term sub with visible piercings and a tattoo. Again, in 2022, I was an apprentice teacher and have since become a full, fully certified teacher. My abilities were never questioned and I received accomplished ratings in my summatives two years in a row. With recent praise from my administrator for strong classroom management. My piercings and tattoos haven't affected my teaching. Students, colleagues, and parents respect me for my work not for my appearance. I've built a strong, respectful relationship based on trust and a positive learning environment. Restricting piercing, tattoos, and colored hair limits inclusivity. For many, appearance is a part of their identity. Just as piercings do not affect my teaching, a student's nose ring or colored hair does not hinder their learning. Furthermore, the dress code's restrictions on laced headbands or scarves used by many students of color to lay down their edges are actually insensitive. While limiting do-rags and bonnets are reasonable, headbands for hair maintenance should be allowed and are not a disruptive. It's time to update our dress code to allow appropriate self-expression for students and staff. Piercings, tattoos, and colored hair should be permitted with reasonable guidelines as long as the tattoos are not vulgar. If a student's parents um, can consent to piercings, then why can't they wear them to school? Thank you. Mr. Willing? The Shadowed Throne, a short story. In a realm where power is as fickle as the winter winds, the Seven, a governing body of immense influence, had a puppet in place. Lady Dragon, a figurehead chosen to serve their interests. Lady Dragon, a woman of unexpected spirit, began to chafe against her chains. Her defiance was further fueled by a blossoming relationship with Lord Locke, a man who never dared challenge the Seven's authority. Though the Seven had approved of this union, they used it as a weakness to exploit. They leveraged Lord Locke as a way to control Lady Dragon's actions, but their machinations were about to unravel. Daria, a woman with secrets to hide, became a pawn in the Seven's game. When her past deeds were exposed, the Seven used her to sow discord between House Locke and House Dragon. Daria, desperate to protect herself, lodged claims against Lord Locke, a move the Seven eagerly exploited. The Seven's actions were not without consequence. Their council, recognizing the illegality of their tactics, advised against such a course. But the seven, driven by greed and power, dismissed their council and replaced them with the ruthless Agos Wald, known for his ability to get things done no matter the cost. Agos assembled a new team to investigate the claims against Locke, and the results were damning. 
The evidence favored Daria leaving Lord Locke's reputation in tatters. The seven seizing the opportunity swiftly dismissed Locke. Dragon soon followed as their puppet was no longer useful. Thus the seven's betrayal had come full circle, leave, leaving Dragon and Locke exiled from the realm they once called home. The power struggle continued with the seven's grip on the kingdom more tenuous than ever before. Winter's coming. Thank you, Mr. Willing. Mr. Ford? Hello, Scott Ford, author and educator. Uh, it is season again, it's certification season, and we're kicking it off with Certober uh, next uh, month during the October break. I posted tickets yesterday just to my students, and we currently have 31 tickets out of 35 taken. Uh, we have, and I'm looking at Eventbrite right now, 23 student tickets out of 25 and eight parent tickets out of 10. Um, this is going to be the last time I do the fundamentals of information technology training. Next semester, we plan on focusing on the computer maintenance certification, the A-plus certifications. Um, I wasn't planning on having saying this until I started taking a look at my tickets, but I need a bigger venue. Uh, my classroom is not going to be big enough. So I'm talking to folks who should be able to make this happen, but if you give me a bigger training center, I would be more than happy to teach 40 to 50, because this is the last hurrah for this particular training. And just as a reminder, we got 30 kids certified last year in this certification, more than the 10 years combined in this district. So Certober, October 7th through 11th, October break, we're doing it from nine to four. Um, I'm not getting reimbursed, I'm not getting PD, I'm not getting any sort of comp time. This is actually costing me about $1,000 out of pocket when all three trainings are done, because I treat it just like a normal training. I give the kids coffee in the morning. Um, they get danishes if they want, they get cookies when they come back from break. So uh, looking for a bigger venue if you have one. Uh, finally, with the storm, uh, Dr. Brown, if you're being pressured to close a school, might I suggest checking on Waffle House. And if, and if they're closed tomorrow, then so should the schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Ruth Ann Luna. And then could I please have Larissa Powell, Pat Fernbacher, and Rodney Powell come sit in the front row. Thank you so much. Ms. Luna? Yeah, actually it's Dr. Luna. Um, I'm also, so sorry. No, it's fine. I'm the parent of two kids at AHS, including my amazing daughter that just spoke earlier. So let me go quick because I got to get through these two minutes. The recent rather abrupt attempt to enforce the existing dress code policy has certainly been a topic of conversation at our dinner table, as you can imagine. I'm very appreciative of the rapid communication of district leadership to clarify that clear options were absolutely acceptable for piercings. And it gives us a great opportunity to pause and review the dress code in its entirety preferably by a committee comprised of students, staff at all levels, and community members. So as I'm sure you're aware, the dress code has not really been enforced at the high school level for past, the past few years, but during this time, teachers still taught, students still learned, and the world still turned. If we needed a pilot project to ensure loosening the dress code policy wouldn't lead to anarchy, well, we have the data that we need. That said, I absolutely support standards for our students and staff, but we need to review these policies to ensure they are standards that reflect the societal norms of 2024. Clothing. Let me say that I would much rather see a young woman dressed in a stylish crop top and nice pants than I would a student in pajamas. If we set a guideline for just how much skin is shown, great, but simply saying no bent drift in any position puts our tall and long torsoed girls at a huge disadvantage. Piercing. I think it's worth it to realize that piercing a nose to these young adults is like getting the second holes in our ears back in our day. In my professional environment, it's very common to see students, staff, and yes, even faculty, tenured faculty, with non-ear piercings. Maybe we start with the max number of piercings or limit the approved locations, but this change will be essential in the retention of staff. Tattoos are 100% acceptable in the professional world, which is the argument against it I hear most often. And we've got to let go of our unconscious bias on this one. I can think of no valid reason why a visible tattoo would impair a teacher's ability to teach, a paraprofessional's ability to handle some of our most challenging students, my son, or a bus driver's ability to get our children to and from school safely. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Ms. Larissa Powell.
Good evening. I hope you're proud for yelling and threatening a 17-year-old girl. Talk about intimidation and retaliation. How did you know that we were speaking tonight? Who leaked it? Good question. After reviewing the responsive documents that I received from an open records request that Ms. Parker and Dr. Brown called and tried to persuade against me from receiving, I have to ask, is the district attempting to conceal the district's assistant athletic director who was accused of embezzling money and destroying evidence? The assistant athletic director filed a complaint against the former athletic director, Troy Kite. This complaint ultimately led to the termination of the district superintendent, Dr. Fagan, who was married to Mr. Kite, Mr. Thomas Newman, Ms. Morgan Morrow, Ms. Sean Frashan. They were a casualty over this cover-up too. The quote from the audit that stood out most to me, as a follow-up to the audit's testing in September 2023, internal audit discovered that blank Kronos edited forms, the documentation of time card edits that could confirm overtime hour worked were destroyed. Don't worry, Ken, no one leaked these documents. I got them from the district's very own Washing Gallegos in that PIA that my husband's going to talk about. Take note of that, please, Mr. Sutherland, instead of screaming at my daughter. You know, it makes sense. Washington Gallegos, AKA the fixer, promised to protect the board at the December 21st, 2023 board meeting when they placed Mr. Newman on leave. They helped y'all cover it up. And they charged the district millions of dollars and we have receipts for it too. The assistant left athletic director had a problem. Some board members wanted to get rid of Dr. Fagan, so here comes the fixer with a solution. Ahuja and Clark was hired to make the problem go away. Y'all, this audit has been in draft status since March. Yeah, March. Thank you, Mrs. Powell. Mrs. Uh, Fehrenbacher? Good evening. My name is Patricia Fehrenbacher, and I'm a proud grandmother of that current high school student and a humble ISD graduate. Tonight I'm here to share some critical information that our community deserves to know. On April 5th, 2024, the former Chief Auditor of Humble ISD, Ms. Sean Fashani, emailed the school board and administration regarding the findings of a forensic investigation conducted by Ahuja and Clark on the athletics department. This investigation was prompted by concerns about payroll time reporting and approval processes overseen by Diana Williams. Ms. Fashani highlighted serious issues in the report, categorizing them as misinformation, misleading information, and missing information. She provided video clips and photos demonstrating that the athletics department was aware Please of record-keeping requirements Yet payroll records for Jana Williams and the Central Administrative Athletic Staff were destroyed after the internal audit began. Ms. Fashani specifically questioned why can these documents- Can we go back into, I'm so sorry. Can I pause you for destroyed. one second and can we go into close? Because I have a legal question I'm not, I, and I apologize for interrupting you. We can take a short recess. So do I start all over again or what? That's your choice. On April 5th, 2024, the former chief auditor of Humble ISD, Ms. Sean Fachani, emailed the school board and administration regarding the findings of a forensic investigation conducted by Ahuta and Clark on the athletics department. This investigation was prompted by concerns about payroll time reporting and approval processes overseen by Jana Williams. Ms. Fashani highlighted serious issues in the report, categorizing them as misinformation, misleading information, and missing information. She provided video clips and photos demonstrating that the athletics department was aware of record-keeping requirements, 
yet payroll records for Jana Williams and the Central Administrative Athletics staff were destroyed after the internal audit began. Ms. Fashani specifically questioned why these documents were destroyed and provided additional evidence that Ms. Jana Williams was aware of the district's record retention policy. On April 6th, board trustee did we interrupt her? You started over again, so please give her one more minute. Now? On Sorry. April 6th, <laughs> Board Trustee Robert Scarfo responded by email, expressing surprise and asking why Ms. Fashani had shared this information and who had prompted her to do so. She clarified that this was standard audit procedure and emphasized that her response was necessary to ensure the board had all the facts as the initial report lacked crucial details. So I asked the board, why was this kept, report kept from the public? And now that these financial discrepancies have come to light, will Jana Williams be held accountable? Our community deserves transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fehrenbacher. Mr. Powell? Good evening. My name is Rodney Powell, and I'm a proud father of a wonderful student in this district. I want to share my concerns about our leadership's action over the past year. In April, my wife submitted an open records request for emails that Board Trustee Robert Scarfo forwarded in an unsecured outside server. This was a misuse of his position and violation of privacy for our faculty, staff, and students. Before we received the documents, Dr. Brown contacted my wife, trying to stop the release of information that the Texas Attorney General said must be made public. My wife stood firm and insisted transparency. Shortly after, Board President Chris Parker called her three times, saying that information was embarrassing for her child and their family. This raises an important question. If the documents are sensitive, why did Mr. Scarfo send them to an outside email server? After looking over the documents, it's clear why my wife is pressured. These emails seem to be unliked, <clears throat> must be linked to the Title IX complaints made by Assistant Director, Athletic Director Jana Williams, which have cost us over $2 million in legal fees, led to multiple lawsuits, and triggered an investigation by TA and the Texas Rangers. It's troubling to think that some board members used families' <clears throat> difficult situation for their own purposes. Additionally, out of 827 unredacted documents that my wife received, there is a mention of the Assistant Athletic Director's alleged embezzlement involving hundreds of thousands of dollars in unauthorized overtime. Instead of our board decided to pay an outside accounting firm $60,000 to cover up an issue, this is simply unacceptable. I'm asking the board to put our district first and address these serious issues and demand the immediate termination of Washington Galagos, the Assistant Athletic Director, and anyone involved in these unethical actions. We need to restore the integrity and trust in our district for the sake of our children and the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Um, Ms. DeLeon, and then if I could have Ms. Martinez come to the front. Ms. DeLeon. Okay. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over something I had last week. So, um, hello, school board members and Humble ISD community. Uh, my name is Gracie, and I am an Humble ISD parent. Spanish was my first language. Uh, I attended Aldean ISD, and at that time, they did not have ESL classes. So, I was immersed with all the English speaking students. So, I had no choice but to speak the, learn the English language. Um, in the past few months, I've been speaking to teachers at Humble High School, and I was honored to attend their open house. Um, and just as expected, it was organized. It, it was a wonderful event, and um, there were a lot of uh, there's a lot of information I've been learning these past few months of where I've been enlightened. Uh, at Humble High, we have a total of 2,970 students, 2,970. Out of those students, 701 are classified as ESL, approximately about 24%. The ESL teachers were actually excited to um, offer 
English classes for these ESL students during the summer. So they want to forfeit their summertime so that they can teach these kids English. Um, Aldean ISD is already doing that, and the way that they do it is they do it in a, at a play so that it's entertaining for these students. Um, I would like to also to be able to provide those resources for our ESL students so that they can master the English language, get out of the ESL program, and be able to be eligible for scholarships. I do believe that by helping a part of that community that as a whole, it helps our students move forward in our district. So that is my request. Um, let's see. And um, hopefully that you guys will um, coordinate with Humble High School and uh, make it available to all the kids in the district because I do know that there are other kids in the ESL programs that would benefit from something like this and that would help their educations and their future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeLeon. Ms. Martinez. Hello, I'm Dr. Martinez and I have students at Summer Creek High School. And I have something written, but I would like to say what happened here earlier was very disappointing, especially when we have an adult directing conversations toward a 17 year old and my voice is cracking because that was not appropriate. And then to walk out on your constituents was also not appropriate. Prior to moving our daughters to Humble ISD, I assessed each high school's curriculum, diversity, education level of the teachers, and the school's morals and ethics. I am here this evening to applaud Summer Creek High School for meeting all of the above criteria. Summer Creek High School has been a good place for our family and others. Sometimes the school may have problems, but all high schools do. Since being here, Coach McDonald and Ms. Murray were very good at answering questions and addressing our concerns. Dr. Mahoney can be seen almost everywhere with a watchful eye over his students. And lastly, Mr. Destin and Mrs. Walker do a great job with the students assigned to their house. As a Summer Creek High School parent, I wanted to share the overall greatness of the school. Because it's only when you're in the space that you really know the atmosphere. Also, our daughter's public school education has and is preparing them for their future academically and socially. We currently have two students at the University of Texas at Austin. I will close with the following quote from El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Um, I would like to clarify one thing that I heard. There was some commentary about Jane Doe, and Jane Doe has not been um, accused of embezzlement. Now, uh, moving on to comments by individual board members. I'll begin with Ms. Lamont Dixon. Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, first, before our honorable um, state rep leaves, I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Cunningham for joining us today. Um, also, um, would like to thank all of our public commenters, but in particular, our students who come out to speak. Um, and I know Mr. Grabowski has echoed this many times, and we know it's difficult for a student to stand up here and speak to us, so we do appreciate that. Congratulations to our Secondary Teachers of the Year. I'm a 14-year former secondary teacher. It is always an honor to be here to see our educators. We know they're working extremely hard every day, and you know there are lots of changes in high schools and all of these things, so we're very thankful for them and just wanted to say congratulations. And then last, um, I want to look over to my right to Chief Cook. As a former TCO commissioner, um, who finished my term in February. Congratulations. I know we had rules and things that we had to do from a Sunset Review perspective, um, but thank you so much for serving in that capacity, and it's an honor to always work with you. Congratulations to you and your entire team. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anybody over here? Mr. Holmes? Uh, yes, um, teachers of the year. Um, I know that most of them have left, but I hope um, 
it reaches back to them that are quite um, honored to be in your presence um, for just, again, your time, your attention, and just giving of yourself. So again, um, congratulations on the awards. And again, um, thank you. Chief Cook, I've known you. I think you are the longest standing person within Humble that I've known. I've known Chief Cook for well over 20 years. When I first moved from Humble from over off of Eldridge Parkway and I-10 when I used to live in that area, um, I think, Chief, you were back on the force then, I would assume, right? But um, he was one of the first people that uh, I had met. And um, just to see um, your commitment to excellence and you know, really building up this force, um, I just want to say just again, honored to know you. And congratulations to you and your team. Um, a couple of other things that I'll just um, uh, mention. Uh, Mrs. DeLeon, I uh, completely agree. I think she's left, but again, um, if you can get it back to her, I would love to discuss something like that. I love new ideas, so if um, somebody can pass along her information, but just like to discuss what that would look like, what's the universe of possibility on it, uh, really, really like it. And um, the young lady and her mother that touched on the dress code, I, I, I wanna say this, right, I think, um, just because we weren't enforcing the policy and adhering to it as probably strictly as we needed to in years past, doesn't mean that we, you know, it's never a, 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 a wrong time to start doing what you've put in a policy, but um, I think we maybe do need to explore the possibilities of where, if there's any quality, right? I think that needs to be discussed and um, I think it has been some time since we've we've discussed that policy, maybe there are some things we need to look at. Because I'm, I'm, I, I went and took a look at my own um, corporate policy on tattoos and earrings, and I work for a Fortune 500 company. And there is no, again, as long as it's not lewd, if it's in decency and in order, but um, you can wear a nose ring. Matter of fact, I have colleagues that have nose rings. Um, that are in a professional setting. And again, I have friends that, um, and colleagues that have sleeves, tattoos. So I think there are some things we need to just look at. Now, I also want to make sure that we're preparing our students for when they enter their workforce. And there are just certain things that um, aren't acceptable that need to be discussed. But what I like from the mother and her daughter is, well, can we look at some parameters that maybe are in between that, you know, just set some guardrails. So again, just something I think we need to look at. But again, I, I do appreciate the young lady um, having the courage to come up here and speak. So again, um, hopefully we can bring that uh, up again and around the corner again, um, Dr. Brown. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Mr. Kirchhofer. Thanks, Madam President. And I thought I was so mad tonight that I was going to miss the debate. You know, I, yeah, yeah, I uh, Ruth Ann and um, Lark and Luna, I knew Luna before she was even uh, born. They were my neighbors. Um, thank you to everybody that spoke tonight. Um, we can all um, agree to disagree, and it's important for us to listen to everybody. So, um, don't want it to rain down on Chief Cook and the teachers and, uh, it, you know, it's, they're the most important here, them and the kids and uh, the teachers that were here. Congratulations to the high school and middle school uh, teachers and we'll have the elementary, so I guess next month. But thank you and congratulations, Chief, and uh, thank you to Charles, our state representative, Mr. Cunningham, for being here. Mr. Scarfo? Thank you, Madam President. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll, re I'll repeat that. Congratulations, our Teacher of the Year. It's always great this time of year. And then next month, we'll get to see the Elementary Teacher of the Year and be able to congratulate them as well. Um, Chief, you know how I feel about you. And you the man, and you know you the man, and it, you're great. And thank you for how you've shaped this over the years. This What, what we have today is really just your will bringing it to be and bringing it to bear. There, and I saw over, oh, I'm sorry, times I've been involved, uh, 
there were a lot of hurdles. And I'm glad you talked with me and, uh, and you shared things with me and, uh, to help. And I, I'm just really glad that you were able to find other ways around those hurdles. So congratulations to you and your entire department, everybody who's here and who's out, out there in the field now, today and tomorrow and the rest. Uh, Godspeed. Thank you very much for all you do to protect all of us and our students and our community. Thank you. Um, and I know Dr. Lona, not, uh, she left. I thought she'd still be here by the time we got to talk and, and Largan. Um, yeah, uh, great comments. And um, yeah, we do. And I think uh, it's something Mrs. Parker probably want to pull a committee together to uh, start looking at this and um, having people in the community and whatever, staff. And yeah, it, it, I, it's time. And uh, you know, it's tough to get Pandora back in the box, as they say. So we need to, we need to move forward. And, and not not go backwards. Um, and, and I'm just going to say one last thing. Um, this narrative that I've I've seen on social media, and I've seen spoken in emails and wherever um, about a current employee, to me is just despicable because it's not based in fact. And I'm, I'll just leave it at that because I do know the facts. So thank you, Mr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Scarfo. Mr. Grabowski. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, to all the teachers of the year, and again, next month we'll do that again. I know I'm being repetitive, but um, it's an amazing accomplishment. I always feel this way when you get an award from your peers. I don't think there's a better award out there. And to Chief Cook, I'm brand new. We created a, I mean, the committee we created was brand new, the safety committee. And I've been fortunate enough that Chief took me under his wing and Air Force term, I know, but um, guided me through how to work and lead, and he said a quote tonight as he let me read his plaque, and it was, it takes a village to educate a child and it takes a village to keep them safe, and um, sure words could not have been said. Am I correct, Dr. Brown? Uh, we have a suicide awareness walk Thursday night, Turner's, Thursday night at Turner Stadium, right? I can get a little heavy on you here. Um, the veteran that I am, you know, veterans see a lot. They go through a lot, they witness a lot, and it's tough times. And um, I got a very interesting email from a friend of mine today about maketheconnection.net. He's uh, working out on the West Coast trying to eliminate, would be awesome, veteran suicide. But this goes to everybody, goes to everybody. But I'm aiming at the veterans because it's a very high rate in our military, unfortunately. Um, I don't understand it, I don't get it. Um, there's a lot of issues about suicide that are very complicated, but if you're having thoughts, you need to take that first step and reach out. I spoke to Dr. Brown about this earlier today. If you need someone to reach out to, if you know somebody, somebody in this room knows somebody that's having thoughts or those online or you watch it archived, you may be the spouse of one, you may be, you may be a vet, you may be the child of a vet, you may be the father of a vet, a mother of a vet or whatever family member or friend. Let that person speak out, give them help. Come to me. I, after the meeting, I walk out. I'll talk to you. If you want to talk as adults, I'll talk to anyone. Dr. Brown has offered the same. I, don't, I didn't ask to say this. I'm sure it's true. You go to anyone in Dr. Brown's staff, they're going to help you. You go to any one of the seven of us, we're going to help you. I can't speak for the board, only the president, Mrs. Parker, can. But I'm telling you, I know our personalities. We will reach out to you. I just want to close by saying, Veterans, you're respected, you're loved, you're a national treasure. Please reach out if you're having thoughts. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Grabowski. Uh, I would say that we may not agree on every decision up here, but I think we all can agree that safety of students is the number one priority for everyone. And I wanna thank you, Chief, for your leadership in keeping students safe, and congratulations on your well-achieved uh, award. Um, I also wanted to say uh, congratulations and thank you so much to Addie's Faith L3 and Mothers Against Cancer. Pediatric cancer is a passion of mine, and uh, uh, 
I've been on Mothers Against Cancer, I guess, 15 years and working for cancer research and to help families of cancer patients. And so I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that there's awareness going on in Humble ISD, and it's something unique to our district. So thank you to the cabinet administration, um, every teacher out there for participating in Gold Fight Win. Y'all are awesome and amazing. And with that, Dr. Brown, comments by administration. Just a couple. So congratulations to the Humble High School football coach, Robert Murphy. Think about the number of football teams in the greater Houston area, and he was named Coach of the Week for the first week. That's pretty awesome. And if you get a chance, October 1st is college night at the Civic Center. If, if, if your calendar permits, please drop by. That's a great event. Uh, and so I hope you get a chance to see that. So I think that's it for me tonight. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Moving on to our next agenda item, action items from closed session. Item 4A, personnel recommendations. Mr. Holmes, do I have a motion? Yes, Madam President. Motion to approve the administration's personnel recommendations as presented in closed session with addendum. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Lamont Dixon seconds. Um, all those in favor? I don't think we need to discuss personnel in public. So um, all those in favor? Any opposed? The motion carries. Item 4B. Uh, or motion to uphold the administration's decision on the level three parent complaint under board policy FNG as presented in closed session. Second. Or do we want, to, did we determine, Ms. Lamont Dixon, Mr. Rush? There's a second, so now there's a discussion. <laughs> okay, now there's a discussion. All right. All those in favor? All right. All those opposed? Well, the motion would carry then. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, so the motion would be, you have the motion, so all those in favor, all those opposed, one abstention. So the motion does carry. Okay. Uh, uh, item 4C, consider Approval of Settlement Offer in Holt Construction Corporation versus Umble ISD, cause number 422-CV-04480 in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas, Houston Division. Mr. Holmes, do I have a motion? Yes, motion to approve the settlement offer in Holt Construction Corporation versus Umble Independent School District, cause number 422-CV-04480 in the United States District Court for the Southern Southern District of Texas, Houston Division, and delegate authority to the superintendent to finalize and execute all agreements, change orders, and take all actions necessary for the same. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Scarfo. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Moving on to item five, our consent agenda. Item 5A, approval of minutes of previous meeting. Consent. Item 5B, approval of goods, professional services, and non-construction services exceeding 50,000 in the aggregate or 25,000 individually. Consent. Item 5C, 2024-2025, construction and construction-related purchases. 
Consent, item 5D, bond, tra uh, bond fund transfers and amendments. Consent, item 5E, budgetary transfers and amendments. Consent, item 5F, tax refunds. Consent, item 5G, 2024, umbel ISD tax roll. Consent, item 5H, 2024, umbel ISD appraisal roll. Consent, item 5I, board authorization of interlocal agreements. Consent, item 5J, approval of RFP number 20. 22-101-24 miscellaneous instructional materials. Consent, uh, item 5K, approval of RFP 2021-005-14 general merchandise. Consent, item 5L, approval of RFP uh, 2021-006R-15 educational services. Consent, um, consultants. Item 5N, approval of RFP number 2024-102-10, software and subscriptions, web-based applications, consent, item 5N, deduct deductive change order, consent, item 5O, general contractor for selection for the 2024 MEP equipment replacement project, consent. Mr. Holmes, can I get a motion? I move to approve consent agenda, consent agenda items 5A through 5O, do I have a second? Second. Mr. Scarfo seconds. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Item passes 6-0. Moving to item 6A, 2024 Umbel ISD tax rate adoption. Mr. Holmes, do I have a motion? Motion to... Motion to approve the ordinance to set tax rate for 2024, which will adopt a total tax rate of $1.1052 per $100 of taxable value. The rate being adopted made up of .7552 for maintenance and operations tax and a .0035 for debt service. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Lamont Dixon. Any discussion? Mrs. Lamont Dixon. I just wanted to take a, an opportunity here to, to invite the board. If you want to come to the CFO Summit on September 24th at HCAD, Mr. Beatty will be there. I'm usually there. Um, there is a registration link that I could send to you if you want to learn more about how this process works. I did get permission today to share that with school uh, board members throughout Harris County. So I just wanted to offer that. It's on September 24th at the HCAD administration building. It is all day from 8 to 3, but you can come and go as you choose. But I can send the link to Karen, I'm sorry, Miss Martin, and she can just share it with the board. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> item passes 6 0. Next is our information items item 7A, intruder detection audit. Mr. Perkins? Since our last board meeting, we've had no TEA intruder audits. Thank you. Uh, next, item 7B, updates from our board associations and committees. Does anybody have a report? Item 7C, transportation information. Dr. Siebert, would you please give the presentation on bus ridership? All right, well, wakes you up, okay. All right, good evening. Parents want to know their children are safe to and from school. School buses provide a dependable and convenient way to get to school. Families should all be treated fairly. These are core beliefs that our community shares. Therefore, it's not surprising when families often become upset when they lose transportation service they previously had. Humble ISD would actually love to provide bus service for all students across our community if we could. However, tonight I want to share with you why some districts like Humble ISD currently don't bus all students across the district. So, in order to bus students across the district, it takes funding. As I stated earlier, we'd love to bus all students if possible. However, there are some tight budget constraints that make that quite difficult. 
First of all, Texas provides funding for some students, not all students, to be, to be bused to and from school. First of all, they provide funding for those who live more than two miles from their school. They provide funding for those who are identified as homeless, and they also provide funding for those who are, who are identified as special education students and need transportation through an ARD process. Additionally, they provide additional funding for students who live within two miles of a school, but they meet the definition of living near a hazardous route, which is defined by TEA. Across our district, we currently have 2,228 students who are eligible to ride a bus living near a hazardous route. However, even though Texas does fund some education, some transportation funding, they don't fund all of it. As you can see from the graph here, so last year we received $3.7 million in state funding for transportation. In order to bus all of our students, the actual cost we paid as a district to bus those kids was about $14.7 million. So the state only funds a fraction of the amount of money we get to bus students across the district. Dr. Siebert, could yeah. you, could you repeat, would you repeat that please? Yep, so last year we spent $14.6 million in busing students. However, the state only paid us $3.7 million to bus students. So they, they, fund a, they say they fund transportation, but they only fund a, a fraction of it, if you look at it that way. There's a huge gap. $11 million gap. And we actually, Mr. Beatty actually researched it, and this is comparative to other districts as well. So the larger districts spend more, and they get the same about proportional amount. So this is, isn't unique to us. This is every district across the state. So we know this year there have been lots of questions about, well, why, how can we bus more students? What can we do? So we decided to explore this option. We asked ourselves, what if we wanted to reduce the mile from two miles that we knew now down to one mile? We know we would have to fund that on our own. In, or, in order to do that, there's two things that we would need. First off, off, first off we would need buses. So we need about 60 more buses to reduce that mileage down. And that would cost over $10 million, just, to, just a one-time cost to buy those buses. Then there's a recurring cost on an annual basis to run those buses. That pays the salaries for our drivers, pays fuel costs, and pays to maintain those buses on an annual basis. Just to start with, it would be nearly $2.7 million. We already know we have tight budgets, but that's where it's at. So we know that's kind of high. So we know we have different levels of kids, elementary, middle, and high. What could we do if we wanted to bus just the elementary kids, the youngest of kids, and shrink that down to a mile? So that's the largest number of students that need, that would, that of that group. So we would only need 49 buses versus the 60. So that brings the one-time cost down to about $8 million. And the recurring cost will be just over $2.1 million to do that on an annual basis. So... As we looked into it, we're like, well, even if we could find the money, if we could find some couch, couch cushions and there happened to be the money there, um, where could we do that now? And the answer is actually no, we can't. Buses take about 12 to 18 months to get. We currently have a bus that was ordered last school year, last September, October. It's not, we have seven that are supposed to be delivered this October. So there's a long lead time in order to get those buses. Additionally, hiring drivers is difficult. This year is probably the best year since I've been here. We're only short probably about three or four drivers at this time, so that's awesome. But hiring 60 drivers in a challenging environment to, with those who have CDLs, who can get jobs outside of, transport, out of, outside of school districts where the pay is even higher, is very competitive. So at the earliest we could even implement something like this would not be until 2026 in, in that time frame. So, Humble ISD, like other districts, we frequently get questions. Can't you make an exception for me? It's hard to do. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Can you not, can you change it just for my situation? So previously, there were temporary exceptions made for three, three neighborhoods. Students that were zoned in Centennial Elementary, Groves Elementary, and Westlake Middle School. There were temporary exceptions made at the time these neighborhoods were being built. As they were built, there weren't uh, permanent paths yet. There weren't safe walking paths to school at that time. However, as times changed and the neighborhoods were built out, walking paths were provided, so there was a temp there was a phasing out of the temporary exceptions. The first step we did at the beginning of the 23-24 school year was we removed busing for those students who lived within a mile of the school. Secondly, this year, the beginning of this year, we phased out busing for the students who live within two miles of the school. 
And now this area is treated no differently than the rest of the neighborhoods across our district. So if you look across our district, out of our 48,000 students, 46% are not eligible to ride a bus. So those three neighborhoods are now in line with about half of the district where they're not eligible to ride a bus. Even though we have 46% of the students eligible to ride a bus, only about 26% right now actually ride a bus. So 74% of students across our district find other ways to get to school. That could be through a parent, through carpool, through walking, through riding a bike, through daycare, or even through a private transportation service. So as we've talked about it, it's been a topic of discussion not only for us, but other districts. We've explored on this chart 25 other districts that are comparable or near us. As you look at them, approximately 17 have the same policy we do, in which they bus students who are more than two miles from the school, not closer. So eight of them make exceptions in some way, shape, or form. For instance, SciFair recently changed theirs. They used to bus everybody, and now they've stair-stepped it into different amounts for different levels. So to summarize this quick presentation, we would love to bus all students if possible. However, there's two things that we would require. One, it would require millions of more dollars, money to buy the buses, and money to recurringly pay for the service it would take to run those buses. The second thing it would require is time. It would take time to get the buses, to hire the drivers, and to plan the, the routes. However, if we were to look into it, we would want to make sure we're treating all districts across the whole district consistently and fairly as we are now. So hopefully that ha helps answer some of the questions you guys had or things you were wondering about transportation. Any questions or discussions from the board regarding this item? Mrs. Lamont Dixon? Um, wh while I do understand, and I know it's, this is a very challenging conversation to have, um, but you know, as a parent, we've all had elementary kids at some point in Humble ISD. It does seem like it still should be a priority. And so I guess the question I have are, are number one, are there any grants that we consider, could consider, or partnering even in some respect, maybe with the foundation or having a campaign in some way to help fun parts of that? Um, so that's the first question. Um, and then the second part, I guess, is, you know, we, even M Madam Chair mentioned that for us, safety is number one. And I agree, I believe every single board member that that is the number one priority. And two miles for an elementary kid is a long way to walk. So are we helping to find solutions? Yes, I know parents do it every day. You take your kids, there's buses, there's driving services you can hire seniors to help pick up your kids and that type of thing. But I do think we need to take a, a deep dive in being the solution seeker for the problem. Um, so like, you know, some countries have something that they call like a walking school bus. So maybe the PTAs could organize together and do a walking school bus where they're picking up kids and they're walking together, but there's an adult with that child. I just think there's things that we really need to think about and I think we should help the parents figure this out. Um, not just to say, oh, well, sorry, we can't help you because it costs us too much money at this point. Does that make sense? Because I, I understand the problem. I get it. But I do think that, you know, we've had committees that, that involve the community, where the community came together with certain um, personnel in the district to come up with solutions to help solve problems. So it's just a thought. Yeah, we are actually looking at grants. I've asked the transportation department as we're, as we're buying buses for the next 12, 16 months to see what grants are out there to help. So we're looking, trying to find those. Um, right now, a lot of them for electric buses, which cause some issues because they cost more to maintain and they also cost a lot up front and there's a front end. But we are looking at grants. As far as safety, that's funny you mentioned walking buses. We actually had a discussion about that the other day. Mr. BD brought that up and we were discussing about that. And Chief, this year, is helping pilot some um, additional crossing guards a little further from the schools to help with those that are walking. We've picked a couple areas that he's working with, and we're walking, and we're looking for that, but we can always continue to look for more and more options to try to help our community. Mr. Scarfo? Yeah, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Siebert, and, and your staff, and, and Mr. Beatty was part of this, too. So I know, and, and uh, also, uh, Mr. Perkins, it was a lot of work that went into coming 
really delving into this. I know Mr. Holmes had asked for information, and we got to see it um, last week on the Building and Planning Committee, um, a preview of what you were going to do. And, you know, I, as we talk there, and I'll repeat here, that this really is um, an advocacy issue, I think. And it's too bad you didn't give this before Mr. Uh, Mr. Cuttingham left, so he could be, take back some good information. We should probably get this to him so he could uh, bring this uh, forth. Because this is something, as you showed that slide, a lot of other, district, or other districts, probably across the state, are grappling with because the, that delta is so huge uh, mm -hmm. between what they say, oh, we fund transportation over, um, over two miles. Well, not really. Um, and I think, again, you have that issue, real hard issue of, even if we magically could buy those buses, you're not gonna find anybody to drive them, not that many. Um, so I think, um, and Ms. Uh, Lamont Dixon, I, I agree that we always should try to be problem solvers. But I tell you, this one, I fear from really getting deep into the data with those guys the other day, um, it's really a little bit beyond us. We really need to, our advocacy committee, really needs to really bang the drum to parents because we have a lot of people in our community that have been concerned about this and I'm concerned about it too. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want babies, you know, walking those kind of distances and, um, and whatever. And the, the way they did bring up the walking school bus and I said, the only problem with that one is it kind of breaks down when it's really raining hard, you know, to, to do something like that. But it's still, it's, it's an idea. It's something you look at and, uh, and I, I agree, mm -hmm. absolutely. But I really think that, um, this is something we really need to be, in addition to things like um, paying us by enrollment and not uh, ADA. Uh, it, to me, those are like the two biggest things we could be hammering in this next session. But uh, anyway, thank you guys again. for It was great for people to at least see this, and it'll be up there. People can grab the presentation and see the information because it's, it's a lot of money. We don't have it. Ms. Lamont Dixon. And Mr. Scarfo, I wholeheartedly agree. And as chairman of advocacy, we are definitely fighting the ADA piece, but I'm happy to add this to our purview. Thank you. Mr. Holmes. Right, so um, I, I like the walking school bus uh, idea. I know in hearing from the community for the Westlake area, um, you know, the Groves, Westlake, Centennial, um, I was even thinking, and I had brought this up to you, Madam President, as well, just looking at maybe doing a, uh, a town hall on solving the problem, right? I think, again, it looks like from a budgetary standpoint, that's going to be quite difficult. And yes, I'm also part of the advocacy committee, so definitely willing to partner with you on that. Um, Ms. Lamont Dixon, I think that um, from what I've gathered and in, in kind of just... Um, just asking uh, Dr. Brown and just listening to the community, it seems like it's right there in that artery where Westlake is. And I think it's because, again, it went from, you know, we, we let the community know, hey, we're, we're gonna be kind of removing this, you know, this, this radius and now it's here. And I think it's, it's just still a bit of a shock. And there is some, some challenges there and safety is uh, paramount for our children, especially our younger ones. So, um, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to the community some more and just think about again, that walking school bus is probably the most easy, quickest way to resolve it. But again, I want it to be um, structured. So Dr. Brown, I, I'd like to just look at maybe, a, there's a few people that are willing to champion a few things, a few of the uh, mothers and fathers, and I think we just need to look at that. We need to find something. We need to do something. So, um, you know, I'll be reaching out to uh, some of the people that have reached out to me personally. Mr. Scarfo? Yeah, uh, just one thing I'd like to, just so it's not lost, and just for the record, um, we, we have to be fair and equitable, as you said in your, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, again, for the record, th it wasn't like people who were getting the exception transportation, all of a sudden one day, so, oh, it stops tomorrow. There was a long lead time. It was laid out from the start. And I just want people to, to know that. Nobody pulled the rug out of anybody from, out from under anybody. It, it was rolled out over a long time, a lot of communication, uh, Ms. Mount's group, I mean, it, it really was. So nobody can say, oh, we're surprised, I didn't know that was gonna happen. Well, then you weren't paying attention because everybody in the district who was involved and is responsible did a great job, in my opinion, to make sure people knew, had a lot of lead time, 
hey, here's what's happening, here's how it's going. And you didn't even do it like everything happened on one, day one. It, mm -hmm. You phase that out, you phase the exceptions out over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to make that clear that everybody understands that. that uh, I, I want to say, I, spot on, um, Billy, uh, Mr. Perkins, how long ago did we start letting people like me, I live in the groves, when did we start letting people know that we were going to be reducing that radius over time? Was it two years, was it starting two years ago, 18 months ago? It was a while. It was about a year ago. It was about a year ago. Okay. It's just, it, it creeps upon you quick. And it wasn't one time. No, 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 no. It, I, yeah, no I, I can vouch for that. It wasn't. Any further discussion? Our last item, 7D financial services report, is a monthly administrative item. Any questions or discussion from the board regarding this item? Mr. Scarfo? I, I just have one question. Uh, and Mr. Biddy, I'll put you on the spot. I, I, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to send you an email earlier to get the information. Where are we with the figures on open enrollment as to date? I mean, we, have we crossed 100 yet, or are we still hovering around there? Uh, I'm just curious. Um, at, off of memory, I think we did cross, but it was 101. Um, the more, we're at 101 right now, and you're confirming that, yeah, yeah 101. Okay. All right. And then, then I guess my next question would be, what are we thinking about with potentially plugging a gap? Because even with all the things that Mr. Perkins and his, his group have done to try to goose up that attendance rate the night, to get to our night to 93, hopefully, which would be great, uh, from where it was the last two years, um, that we we put five we put 500 adjusted, so that was like 465 was like 4.2 uh, mm -hmm. million dollars or um, a little over 4.2, 4. 4. Yeah. yeah, that we we were hoping for. So now, if we're only at 20 percent of that that number, so to speak, uh, I, we're probably talking about a three point three plus million dollar possible hole. So we started thinking about how are we going to do that or we still think we have enough time to make some deeper inroads. I'm just trying to worry ahead, if you will. So that's all. Uh, and, and you can come back later with answers. I, I just want to know. I, I was worrying before um, we got the first enrollment numbers from the first day of school um, just because um, I was worrying about it. Uh, I, I projected out from the first enrollment numbers that we weren't going to meet our original uh, projections as if everything held consistent with years past. Um, so I'm glad we did the, the limited open enrollment because it, you know, let's say we land 200 kids less than what we had last year. It, it could have been 300 and it could have been 300 less. Uh, so that's good. Once we recognize that we are gonna, we're not going to hit that enrollment number, um, we pause the hiring. So we make sure that the uh, position, which is the largest, that the positions we have budgeted, along with that $4 million um, dollars worth of revenue that we thought we'd have for the kids, we make sure we don't fill all of those positions up to that, uh, that limit the, the, of what we had for the kids. So that will save um, and lessen that impact of that hole. So it won't be the full brunt of uh, in this case, the 100 kids is is going to generate about a million dollars of funding. We still have that $4 million that we budgeted for, so that $3 million gap is what we're trying to work with now. I am holding out hope that the attendance percentage, like you said, will be better. So we'll see what that happens. First six weeks is always pretty high, so I think second six weeks is when we'll um, be able to see where that is coming in because we budgeted for that attendance to improve as well. Um, and then from that point, we just control what we can control. So continue, and we always do this, is not just when we're facing a, 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 you know, a hole that we're having to plug, but looking at contract negotiations, uh, looking at whatever avenues are available to us to uh, bring in additional funding. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be on top of that watching and, um, and also just changing our decisions, knowing that we may be under a $3 million uh, deficit there, maybe change some of our day-to-day -day decisions early on so that maybe we can prevent that um, from becoming worse. Okay, well, no, that, that's good to hear, but because 
I mean, some of that's embedded. It's not like we, we don't have to hire or we don't, won't hire because they've already been hired, but we have classrooms that aren't at capacity in, in schools. So that, that's my fear is that, yeah, that's great. And, we, and I know you guys will always, you always do that well as far as, hey, stop because we don't have the heads. But some of that we were hoping was going to take care of what we had to have. Again, because of ADA versus enrollment funding. Yep. So that's, that's really what the crux of it is. And this is just another great example of that and why that's such, a, such an issue. Yeah. And, and again, uh, yeah, we, we did this stuff too late. For Mr. Cunningham already left. So we'll have to make sure. I, I will call him tomorrow and tell him he needs to listen to the last part of the meeting. So thank you, Mr. Beatty. Thank you, President. Moving on to our closing items, are there any topics for future board business? Mrs. Lamont Dixon. Um, well, it's not necessarily for an agenda item, but I think there was a lot of talk tonight about dress code. Um, and I would just like to encourage like a stakeholder committee that has students, parents on that committee um, in order to kind of move this forward. Um, happy to do it in advocacy if that's what you guys want. We got a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm open to that or whatever Madam Chair um, wishes. <laughs> do we need to pull the board on that or... I thought you said you were going to do something about that anyway, so yeah, I don't know that we need to. You guys can just do it. You, right, I was just stating it yeah. essentially for the record. I don't think we have to have consensus. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Holmes? Yes, um, and I don't know if this is more so a committee or something that, um, Dr. Brown, you can take on, but that whole ESL component that uh, Mrs. DeLeon uh, mentioned during her uh, uh, public comment, just wondering what. Is there something we can? Yeah, can we look into that? Can we bring her in? Look into that. I think it's a great idea. Don't yes. know what it would take. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll take okay. a look at that. I'd actually reached out to Miss Daly on earlier, and so okay. we'll take a look at it with the team. And it's Ms. Melissa Harris is saying, "I've talked to her. I've talked to her. So we're already on it. We're already on it. Okay. So thank you, Miss Harris. Right. Anyone else?" The time is now 8.47 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>